Welcome to this Nano in Business webinar on designing a global trade strategy for nanomaterials. Briefly today, I will give a very short introduction to the NIA and then we'll move on uh, with our Director General, Kiara, and she'll be looking at global trade trends. We'll then move on to Ted from our member, BN Nano, who'll be looking at the challenges and opportunities they're facing in expanding their business. And then we'll move on to Joe, who'll be looking at the investor perspective. For those that are members of the NIA, we then move into a Q&A session that allows you to ask questions and discuss the presentations that you've seen. So just a little bit of brief background about the NIA for those of us that, for those of the attendees that aren't members and for those that want to learn a little bit more about us. The NIA is effectively a trade association. We support our members through helping them find regulatory pathways to market with their nanomaterials. We help by providing more confidence in the use of nanomaterials with your customers. And we also try and make sure that everyone understands the, where they are in the value chain and give them advantages on networking and meeting the right people to enable them to get their products to market. We support the development of a robust regulatory framework, both in dealing with our existing members, but also with people who are in charge of putting those regulations into practice, both in the policy terms and also the regulators themselves. We provide the opportunity for business and scientific networking and promotion amongst our members, and we help to build the global commercial nanotechnology ecosystem. Our members vary from commercial producers of nanomaterials and users of nanomaterials through to professional products and service companies and also research organizations and other trade associations. We provide a range of regulatory and policy support and help our members ensure that they understand what the upcoming is challenges and issues are for their work in the regulatory landscape. We also provide a lot of support around policy developments and look at the changing policy around nano and for example how nano is now moving into this sort of concept of advanced materials in a policy sense. We offer a range of business and scientific networking opportunities including a couple of webinar series, nano in business that is one of these. Uh, we have an annual symposium for our members that allow our members to network and meet with other members, but also with policymakers as well. We've got a large social media following that allows us to have a wider reach than beyond our memberships. And we take part in a range of collaborative projects around a variety of issues that are of interest to our members. We'd encourage everybody to get involved and there's a range of ways of being involved with the NIA. You can sign up to our newsletter, follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter, or indeed, and what we'd encourage people to do is to consider becoming a member, which will help you sort of drive the activities of the association, help set future industrial priorities, and be a part of our policy and regulatory consultation work. I'll now hand over uh, to Chiara, who's going to give us the first talk of this, of this afternoon. Thanks a lot, Sean. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen and put my presentation on. So if you could confirm that you see my presentation, that would be great. Yep, we can see it. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. All right, so um, thank you. And welcome also for me again to this uh, NIU webinar. In this first presentation, uh, we'll cover a little bit of the general perspective on global trade. So what current trends, what upcoming developments we can expect, what kind of barriers may have remained or come back when it comes to global trade. And we'll finish with a snapshot on the policy context. Now, uh, trade experts have defined 2021 as a sort of bounce back year uh, after the disruptions caused by COVID. It is interesting to notice that a number of the developments uh, and changes forced on supply chains during the pandemic might actually remain with us for the longer term. So in terms of supply chains, obviously, um, 
companies in the impossibility of flying people around to uh, speak directly with their suppliers and to do uh, supply chain management activities on the ground have had to um, outsource those to local companies. Uh, so much so that actually a number of vendors have started developing supply chain as a service, uh, complete packages. Um, companies have had to shift uh, their work, both in terms of processes. I think the most evident and uh, obvious example of this is the fact that most of us are probably attending this webinar from home rather than an office, but also in terms of product and customer base. An earlier example in 2020 was companies in France that used to have a contract with the in the private sector to supply luxury brands with perfume have instead uh, shifted to uh, government procurement contracts and redeployed their production capacity to uh, hand sanitizer and gel. And finally, localization. I'll actually mention this later on as well, because this is a trend that predates COVID and has been intensified under the pandemic. On the other hand, companies have also started reaching out to sectors that they may not have been working with previously. Um, Deloitte has recently released an interesting report on partnerships that were uh, created during the pandemic as companies have diversified into new markets. And most of the companies interviewed have stated that they actually intend to maintain those partnerships even after the emergency has come back under control. A lot of these developments have been enabled by technology and in particular connectivity. I have also, I have already mentioned the uh, shifting of workforce from the office to homes, but also in terms of shifting of the marketplace from the traditional brick and mortar stores to virtual platforms. Again, this is a trend that predated COVID and has definitely accelerated during the pandemic. And finally, in terms of messaging, Companies have um, shifted a lot of focus on communicating about the challenges they have been encountering, uh, but also on their health and safety measures. Um, I'm going to just um, briefly mention what kind of longer term trends we can uh, also observe on when it comes to global trade. So the conversation on sustainability is something that has been uh, going on for a while, uh, with the EU in particular at the forefront, uh, championing the use of trade uh, to support green initiatives and the uh, attainment of the Paris Climate Agreement. This has reflected uh, also on trade relations, both at country level and at company level. At country level, um, the EU has supported inclusion of sustainability chapters in free trade agreements, which is something that is partly contentious, and I'm going to mention that later on as well. At company level, because um, we, we actually have uh, an investor covering this angle later on as the third speaker, I'm just going to mention here as a very general point that investors have increasingly been rewarding those companies that have started taking climate commitments and have started taking active measures to decarbonize their supply chains. Fragmentation is something I mentioned earlier on. Um, during the pandemic, fragmentation was mainly due to logistical challenges, but this is actually a longer term trend that is mainly been driven by a resurgence of protectionism in a number of areas. Um, a number of countries have increasingly moved away from the WTO system to settle trade disputes and prefer taking unilateral action. Um, there's also a resurgence of tariff trade of tariffs um, and other barriers to trade that I'm going to cover in more detail in a minute. Finally, when it comes to supply chains, uh, the geography of manufacturing has started changing over the last few years, with some of the production that was traditionally located in mainland China moving away to Southeast Asia as well as to Africa. And uh, again, the pandemic has intensified company efforts to properly assess the risk in their supply chain and to put in place mitigation strategies. And finally, there are increasing demands on transparency uh, for companies to disclose uh, how they supply, what, what their supply chains look like, what kind of challenges they are encountering, and how they address those. 
Now, um, just a note on the methodology of this report that I have used as a source here. Um, the European Commission has been publishing a trade and investment barriers report every year for a decade now. And the report covers barriers flagged by industry in all the countries covered by the EU access, market access database. Uh, and that is why a number of countries on this slide are in gray. It doesn't mean that no barriers were reported. It is that those countries are not in the scope of the report. An interesting thing I think when looking at the report is not just its findings for the year 2020, uh, but also in relation to what happened in the previous uh, years. So the top six countries by number of barriers um, have actually been at the top of that particular ranking for four or five consecutive years now, which seems to point to the fact that protectionism is becoming more and more entrenched in trade relationships. To use um, coding language, it, it seems to be becoming more of a feature than a bug in the system. Another um, finding is that there seems to be a contagion effect in the Middle East and Maghreb regions with more and more countries adopting very similar trade restrictive measures. Um, although there are problems reported in the agricultural sectors, the most affected ones are the services and the industrial sector, including sectors that the EU considers of key strategic importance, such as high tech and digital. When it comes to the types of barriers, for the first time uh, in the report publication history, the border measures are actually slightly more than the behind the border measures, which trade experts consider um, a slightly concerning signal because border measures, which are a mix of sanitary and phytosanitary requirements, as well as tariffs and other types of tax, are actually considered to be less sophisticated barriers to trade. So the fact that they seem to be coming back points to a sort of regressive attitude toward um, open and free trade. Behind the border measures are a mix of technical barriers to trade, intellectual property rights, and then a number of measures that all share the common denominator of having local content requirements. So for instance, the rule that if you want to bid for a government contract, you have to submit your application via a local entity, or you have to subcontract part of the value of that service to a local provider. Now, before looking at the policy context, I just want to preface this slide by saying this is a very, very oversimplified uh, snapshot because we wouldn't have the time to go in detail into every single subsector and regional aspect, of course. So, on the United States uh, side, there is um, much curiosity to see whether the new administration will uh, detach itself or follow in the footsteps of the previous administration when it comes to trade. Um, with a progressive detachment from the WTO multilateral approach and the taking of unilateral action on trade disputes. The new administration has already issued two executive orders, one on the review of vital goods, uh, on the supply chain of vital goods, and the other to revive a Buy American campaign, uh, which might actually include some of those local content requirement measures that I was talking about earlier, in particular when it comes to federal government procurement. On the other side of the pond, Brexit has, of course, happened, uh, but the free trade agreement that the EU and the UK concluded at the end of last year is still in the process of being rolled out. In addition, the UK has obtained from third countries the conclusion of bilateral agreements that were basically carrying over into new UK legislation, the same type of agreement that the EU had already concluded with those third countries. Most of those, however, include a review clause, which in some cases is coming into play later this year. So this is definitely a space where a lot of developments are still going to happen in, uh, in the coming years. I'm going to skip the review of EU trade policy because I have a slide on that at the end of this presentation. And I'm just going to mention that the EU at the end of last year concluded a comprehensive agreement on investment with China. This agreement actually needs to be still ratified by both the member states and the European Parliament. Um, trade experts actually do not take this as a given because of a number of tensions that are existing at the moment between the two blocs. 
So um, China is still classified as a developing country at the WTO, which is something that both the United States and the EU have expressed disagreement with. It has a number of restrictions to the export of raw materials, in particular rare earths that are considered as vital for uh, the supply chain of high tech uh, of the high tech sector. And uh, it is also about to fully roll out a social credit system, which has been in the news more on its aspect related to individuals and the kind of social credit score that their activities would give them but is actually also applicable to companies. And so there is a concern that this might be misused uh, to create additional barriers to entry for companies willing to do business in China. Zooming out of China and looking at the broader Asia Pacific region, there are a couple of trade uh, agreements that are coming into uh, oper operational phase. After the US pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the other 11 signatories have decided to go ahead with the agreement, uh, which is now therefore known as TPP-11. And there is also a regional comprehensive economic partnership that was signed at the end of last year. I just want to mention a couple of other uh, free trade agreements that are expected to become operational soon. The EU has concluded an agreement with the Mercosur, so that would be the four countries of uh, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. There is actually a potential banana skin on the road to ratification because of some um, concerns about deforestation practices in Brazil, notably, that might be at odds with the EU requirements of the uh, timber due diligence regulation. And finally, the African Union has brokered uh, a very ambitious agreement to create a free trade area basically covering the whole continent. Uh, this has become operational on the 1st of January of this year, and it has been signed by 54 of the 55 members of the African Union. Not all of them have ratified it yet, but it's on its way to becoming one of the largest free trade areas in the world. Now, I have mentioned the WTO briefly. As you know, a new director general, Mizokonyo Iweala, was appointed last year. Um, it is widely expected that uh, she will have to tackle a few pressing issues at the WTO, notably a number of trade talks that have been stalled over the last years. The problem of the dispute settlement mechanism. I have mentioned earlier on that a number of countries in the last years have taken unilateral action to sorting out their trade disputes. This is partly because the appellate body, that is the dispute settlement body of the WTO, has actually been non-operational for the last couple of years because the appointment of new judges has been blocked for quite some time. And finally, last week it was confirmed that the ministerial conference, the highest decision-making body of the WTO, will hold its next meeting at the end of this year. Uh, the ministerial conference meets every two years. The 2019 meeting had been initially postponed to 2020 and then of course postponed again because of COVID. COVID is also on the agenda of the WTO because um, mainly because of uh, issues related to the access to vaccines. Um, there are a number of countries that are supporting a proposal to, for the WTO to broker talks on how to waive intellectual property rights to give least developed and developing countries a better access to the vaccine and COVID treatments. And a number of countries have at, already in place at the moment some restrictions to the export of vaccine and its raw materials. To conclude, um, I have mentioned earlier on that the EU has released uh, a document on its trade policy review. Now, this is a communication, so it is not a legal document. It is a policy paper that sets out a number of uh, high-level goals for the EU trade policy in the coming years. Uh, this continues um, the, the previous policy of having trade as uh, a driver of the rollout of high social and environmental standards across the world. But for the first time, there is also an explicit um, mention of taking a tougher approach to tackling unfair trading practices. The document outlines six key areas of activity, starting with the reform of the WTO and the fact that the EU also intends to use the WTO as a platform to link more closely trade and climate talks. This is coupled with renewed commitment to multilateralism when it comes to regulation and standardization. 
And I was mentioning earlier on the sustainability chapters. Now, the EU has already included sustainability chapters in a number of agreements it has concluded in recent years. For instance, the EU-Vietnam um, agreement that was ratified last year. Um, but in developing countries, this is a bit of a contentious issue because local companies then have some difficulties in meeting the standards uh, that are included in these, uh, in these free trade agreements. I have highlighted here a point on mandatory human rights due diligence because the Commission is expected to publish legislation on this uh, later this year, probably around the summer, and it is foreseen that these requirements would then form an integral part of uh, the free trade agreement negotiation position of the Commission going forward. On digital trade, um, the EU intends to also propose that the WTO works as a platform to start trade talks with a further liberalization of e-commerce, but also broadly speaking, trade in services. It identifies Africa and the Southern neighborhood as key target areas for an intensification of the trade and investment initiatives going forward. And uh, this final point on the uh, tougher approach to tackling trading practices that I was uh, unfair trading practices that I was mentioning earlier. So uh, I mentioned the communication is not a legal text. However, it does mention that the focus on trade policy should uh, not only be on concluding new trade agreements, but on ensuring that they are correctly implemented. And if necessary, in giving the Commission itself new legal instruments to make sure that the provision of those agreements are actually enforced and that any non compliances might be properly addressed. Um, analysts have uh, highlighted how this is potentially in contrast with the other uh, stated goal of uh, commitment to multilateralism and bringing back the uh, settlement of trade disputes at WTO level. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, this was my last slide. So I'll just hand over back to Sean for the transition. And of course, if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Chiara. Uh, so just whilst we're doing the transition, uh, good to see so many people here in the webinar. Uh, again, if you could all keep yourself on mute. For members, there will be the opportunity at the end of all the presentations for Q&A. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our member, BN Nano uh, and Ted, who's going to be talking there on challenges and opportunities of expanding business from the company's perspective. And Ted, I think if you just say next slide when you're ready for Kiara to move your slides forward. Great, thank you, Sean. Great to be with everyone today. And thank you, Kiara and Sean, for this opportunity. It's been great getting to know you both over this time, and we're very fortunate to have you at NIA. And Kiara, that was a great presentation on, on, the, on the trends and uh, really interesting. And uh, hopefully I could add to that a little bit here and there. So just a brief bio on my end. Uh, I spent time in, in Hamburg as a kid, uh, moved back to the US went to school in Boston, went back over to Germany to study in, in Berlin, and then did a Fulbright in Dusseldorf, analyzing the German and, Euro and um, Chinese energy markets for working for Accenture in, as a business strategist in the automotive and energy sectors. I then went to the Institute for Defense Analyses, which is a DOD think tank for a couple of years before going over to State Department and working as a diplomat in Afghanistan Philippines, Vienna, and parts of Africa and the Middle East. I transitioned over to Vienna uh, late last summer because the opportunity was just amazing. Uh, the, the founders, Steve Wosinski and Jason Taylor, are, are great professionals, great scientists, engineers, and believe that the technology is, is ready to move forward. So I know this presentation is about trends. Uh, I will go over our company briefly just so you understand what our perspective is uh, and why we're talking about the things that we are. So next slide, please. Great, so who are we? We are from uh, North Carolina. I'm out in Santa Monica, California, uh, but the, most of the team is in, out, of, out of Raleigh, uh, also in Burlington. And yes, looking to revolutionize industrial commodities. Our, our 
product is the nanobarb, which is a type of nanotube. I'll go into that in a little bit. And to date, we have produced more out of our factory than has been produced in the entire history of the material. Our costs are lower, uh, purity is higher, and we own the IP. And the IP is res residing with the company, not with any individuals. And we're ready for commercial use. Uh, next slide, please. And what are, and this group probably knows a lot about uh, BMNT, so I won't go into it too much. And again, I can provide this presentation uh, later in much more depth as well as other ones. Uh, so yeah, started in the 1990s, used in, in labs, advanced technology, uh, and, and the price point has always been an issue. And, and these are some of the properties uh, down on the fifth slide about electroresistivity and, and hydrophobic and the thermal stability. We'll go into that a little bit more later. Next slide, please. And then people ask about carbon nanotubes versus boron nitride nanotubes. The similarities are the lightweight aspect, the, the strength and capabilities of them, but there's some really key differences such as the electrically insulating aspect, thermal conductivity and the heat capacity, uh, the water aspect and, and the temperatures, that's a really big one as well. So there really are some big differences and also the environmental aspect. We're a very clean technology. All we need is, is electricity uh, and there's really no waste involved. Next slide, please. And then the nano barb, again, I don't wanna go into too much detail now, uh, but think of it as a rebar uh, and going down to the second to last point, it helps reduce the van der Waals attraction and it allows the, our material to disperse throughout the, the material that we're mixing with, which provides, of course, greater stability, greater strength. Next slide, please. And yes, those are the, the attributes. Aluminum can become as strong as steel. Copper can provide advanced thermal management. Polyester can behave like a Kevlar, heat sinks, environmentally friendly, fire protection. On our website, we have a, a cotton ball that's lit up by a torch and it doesn't actually burn. Uh, and then water purification and uh, also supports hypersonic. Next slide, please. And those are our current products. And, I, and again, I put that up there so you know what we're dealing with as far as export and, and uh, how, that, how that may affect things. But most of it is in the powder form and can also be batches of, of resins, epoxies, that sort of thing. And we're also creating our own master alloys for metals. Next slide, please. And this is our market um, and, and it's broad. And some people have suggested that we really focus on one or two. We haven't done that so far for a couple of reasons. First, our basic product, the powder, can be used for all of these different applications. We don't need a different type of nanobarb for water versus, versus thermal. It's all the same thing. So we haven't narrowed it down yet. And, and actually we have touch points uh, across uh, US DOD uh, and international companies in, in all of these segments. Next slide, please. And that's our market opportunity uh, for, the, for the different segments. And we are in the midst of a raise. Uh, we have Joe coming up next and I, we're all really looking forward to hearing what his insights on, and, on investment. We started our series A on a platform called Net Capital, which has been great so far. Uh, we're also looking to, to speak to more VCs and family offices whether it's US based or internationally. Next slide, please. All right, so here we are. Expanding internationally are obstacles, considerations, and variables. Next slide, please. All right, so some of these were touched upon by Kiara already. Um, COVID, yes, we all know, we all know about COVID. It was mentioned about the, the video meetings, and they have become more productive and probably more efficient. And, and some people will wonder whether we how much travel is really needed in the future. Uh, and, and with the travel, taking into a, a account the costs of it and what is actually expected by, by the partners and clients. Have they become so used to Zoom that it's just easier to host that way as opposed to meeting in person? Uh, Brexit was also talked about in much greater detail than, than I will. We are not planning on manufacturing abroad yet. We'll keep on doing it out of North Carolina. We can send it. Uh, you know, via FedEx very easily. There's no restrictions on that as far as export, import. And we have to reach the amount of, of a ton before we really have any, any issues there. And of course, with nanomaterial, a ton is a lot. Of course, we hope to get there one day. 
hopefully one day soon. But the bigger issue with Brexit is I'm, I'm considering where I might want to go overseas. And the question then is London, is it still the place to go, even without the export issues? How would that be viewed from the continent? The proximity is still there, just something we're thinking about. So then what is the best location? I'll get back to that a little bit later. Next slide, please. This is probably the most important slide. I hope this one will have, have some, some value for you all listening. Um, networking is still the key. Our company is small and we're looking to really make the use of, of our partnerships. And I, and I has been great as far as networking and getting to understand what is out there. They, they really can do deep dives on the regulatory issues, uh, the trends out there, incredibly important partner. I would encourage everyone to look more widely also to maybe join groups that are not specifically within your industry, as long as there's some overlap. And the reason for that is, is the networking aspect. And some groups, are bigger on networking than others. Some have, uh, they, they allow you to reach out to people very quickly. Others, there's a gatekeeper, but that's, that's just fine. But usually they are eager to link you up with other, other members and also uh, the industrial members. I found that is not only a good idea, but absolutely imperative to invest in these relationships and always set that extra meeting, even with somebody that, that perhaps doesn't appear to have the direct value. You know, we have a good example from another organization where we, we uh, I looked to, to meet up with somebody that we had a shared university and I didn't see any initial overlap, but we met and we talked and that person said, oh, I have a, a good friend who works for this company. And now that company is gonna be leading our efforts in Europe as far as distribution. So you just never know. And, and, it, and it really is helpful just to keep at it. And then the strategics. I hope this isn't just a blinding flash of the obvious to, to everybody about the value of linking up with the larger companies. And yes, they have multiple business units and divisions, subsidiaries that can utilize a product. Sometimes, and this is a case with some of the Japanese and Korean companies we've been engaging, you don't know what's beneath the surface. They, they have one thing, but they're in contact with many, many others. And you might not know that from the website. So it's very important and very useful to engage their business development, their engineers, whoever, their forward-facing folks to get on calls and just to see what happens. They might also be able to invest in your projects. Maybe it's just project-based, uh, uh, depending on what where the overlap is. They might also be able to do some, some research in-house. And then of course they can invest more heavily and perhaps eventually acquire. On the topic of the distributor and the broker, I think one must be very careful about choosing one based on their reputation, their reach, and their requirements and their exclusivity. Can they? Can you still approach other companies in the market? What will they require? Um, you don't want to get bogged down. I, I know that we've had some relationships in the past, and, and when I came on, uh, I wasn't sure where they were at and, and how much they were doing. And not that it was their fault for maybe not doing more, but it's important to understand what their work rate is and what their focus is. Are they doing many other things or is nano really what they're passionate about? So that is, I think, very important to understand that going in. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, prepping the battle space. I know that's a very DOD uh, expression, but it, it can encompass a whole lot. And giving serendipity a chance to happen, that's just something my dad would always say. I like to put it out here and it's something I keep in mind uh, because it's not just about getting being lucky or uh, just being in the right place at the right time. That's not enough, I don't think. It, it's more of a proactive approach. But as far as prepping the battle space for a small company, uh, there are many factors of looking into where you, where you want to land. And I use Germany as an example. If it's Germany, do you want to be in the capital? You want to be in Berlin? Do you want to be closer to the money in Frankfurt? Do you want to be closer to industry, maybe in Southwest Germany? Uh, how easy is it to travel in and out of these places? And then what does your location say about your company? I know that's kind of a soft issue, but I think it's still important to say, it, just, it says where you're, where you're based out of in Europe. What does that mean? Uh, and also where is your company in, in the life cycle? Social media. I'm, I'm, by, I'm definitely not a social media expert, uh, but I do know the power of LinkedIn and I know the power of other platforms. And whatever one uses, 
it's important to use it properly. If it's not just good enough to have something and, and post stuff once in a while. If you're not posting it regularly, if you're not doing it properly, using it the way that the users deploy it, then it's better probably not to have anything at all. And social media can do a lot to get the name out there. And, and again, LinkedIn is a central way to, to build that out. And serendipity. Um, this might not apply to everybody, but it definitely applies to us. It applies to my mindset about being in a place that you, that you want to be. And it could be that some of the data suggests you should be in one city, but for other reasons, you might want to be in another. For family reasons, also for maybe other trade associations, maybe it's close to a university, maybe it's just a place that a lot of uh, companies come to for conferences, whatever it might be. So yes, do the analytics, uh, look at the trends, look at everything. And then the end of the day too, you have to live there. So it needs to be a place that, that, that makes sense all the way around. And then reading the tea leaves, geopolitical issues. Kiara mentioned a bunch of them, uh, great power politics, the issues with uh, China and the US, supply chains, the Buy America aspect or the rare earths. Uh, everybody knows the rare earths are not necessarily rare. It's just where they're mined. Australia is doing a lot more. The U.S. is going to be doing a lot more. How can the nano space support that? For, for us, we're obviously not a rare earth. Borhan and nitride are very abundant uh, materials. However, we have discovered or realized that because of the boron aspect, we might have application to, to energy issues. And DOE uses energy companies in general sometimes use rare earths. And there might be areas where we can maybe not replace them completely, but maybe a little bit. And that's something that we all should be thinking about is where can we fit into the supply chain? And I think to add on what Kiara said, from the US perspective, it is not just about buy America, produce America, it's also leveraging and working with the allies. And I think that's gonna be a trend of this administration. We're seeing that already, the desire to reach out and to bring other people on board other partners on board across the EU and, and elsewhere. It's not just about countering adversaries, but it's about building partnerships. And I, I, think that, I think that we will be seeing that. I think that we will be seeing with the 5G leveraging uh, European companies and, and the point about Africa and, and, and all, the, almost the entire continent becoming a free trade area. And given just the, the numbers of Africa and, and, and the youth level uh, they have or the demographics is going to be a massive market. Uh, maybe not immediately for nano, but we should look to that as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and that's that's it. So that's what I have so far. I don't want to speak any any further. My time is up anyway. And thank you again for the opportunity. And we'd be happy to answer any questions uh, later. Over to you, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that then, Ted. And we'll just let Joe get his slides up. And Joe, over to you to give us a little bit more from the investor's perspective. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, Sean. You can see the slide? Yes, yes, yes thank you. Do. Okay, great. Brilliant. Okay, uh, thanks so much for giving the opportunity to uh, present. So today we're gonna talk about Investing in nanotechnology. My name is Joe Piverunas. I'm the founder and managing editor at Nanolize. So what is Nanolize? We're a boutique research firm that covers disruptive tech. Uh, we started covering nanotechnology, thus the name Nanolize. And since then we've um, branched out into all the disruptive technologies that you can uh, see on the screen. I think what characterizes us from other research firms or definitely other media firms is um, we're, we're quite risk averse. So you won't have any problems finding people out there telling you what you ought to be investing in. You won't find a lot of people telling you what you shouldn't be investing in, especially in the tech space. So um, we really take a risk averse approach to everything we look at. We're a bit irreverent. So um, we say things how they are and, and a lot of people don't like that. And we certainly don't apologize for that. What we do make sure we do is that um, we provide people with very insightful content, right? So um, you'll learn from our content and it's certainly never boring. Um, we'll talk today about the evolution of nano investing. So 
you can see here we've slapped up one of those uh, Gartner hype cycle bits there on the left and kind of try to spell out a timeline here. So I think it all started in 2003 when George W. Bush signed in the Nanotechnology Research and Development Act and suddenly everybody on Wall Street was interested in nanotechnology. Um, it was before that we started our forums. We, we started out as in a forum format, right? A discussion. If you remember the old uh, forums used to be a popular thing. That was something that almost 20 years ago, right? So um, back then the, the quote unquote nano stocks were names like Flamel and Star Pharma. So they were doing nano drug delivery. NVEC was doing uh, NRAM, right? So they were either using nano nanotubes to create a superior RAM. You had Tiny, which was Harris and Harris Group. They were a publicly traded venture capital firm that invested in a lot of the, the rising stars, right? Uh, the Nanosys, Cambrios, the, those lot. Um, and, and, and around that time too, what we observed were a lot of uh, over-the-counter scams. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with over-the-counter stocks. Um, people call them penny stocks. And that isn't just about the price. It's more about the exchange. When you have, and, and it isn't just specific to the states. You, you can find it all over, all over the globe on smaller exchanges. When you have uh, fewer requirements for reporting, people take advantage of that. And it isn't just about being scammed. It's also about incompetent management teams, right? So as an investor, do you really care if you lost your money because management was incompetent or they were scamming you? It doesn't matter. You lost your money, right? So um, what we saw, it, we used to call it nano in the name, right? Suddenly you had every single company out there was doing nano, just depending the word nano. And a lot of them were over the counter. And um, most of those blew up, 99% of those blew up. So um, if, if, you're, if you're a retail investor and, and doing some, some stock picking or investing in, in stocks yourselves, don't, don't just stay away from that stuff. It's all garbage. Uh, so at the peak, what they say, the peak of inflated expectations were some big names that were expected to be the next Microsoft. You had Nanosys and, and Nantero, right, uh, doing different things. And then you have today. And today, I, I would say we're, we're, we're starting to creep up the slope of enlightenment. But um, it, it, today, what we're going to talk about specifically are nanomaterials and the ones that had all the promise, right? So the OGs of nanomaterials were the ones, the carbon nanotubes, quantum dots, and dendromers, right? So um, there were a lot of different applications for nanotubes, touch screens, um, memory, of course, as we said, and displays, quantum dots, yeah, displays, healthcare. And then dendromers for, for drug delivery. And then there was everything else that was a, a nano material. Uh, you had nanoclays, nanowires, composites, horns, diamonds. We've, we've heard of one today, the nanobarbs, right? Um, there were all kinds of different nano materials. And then the, the, run, the, the one that got the most attention that was supposed to rule them all was graphene, right? So that came out of the University of Manchester and it had all this promise, right? So there was the, the elephant that if you took a, a piece of cellophane and you put it over a pencil, and an elephant stood on it and the cellophane was made out of graphene. It wouldn't poke through the pencil, right? There's all these great, cool stories. And, and when you heard about graphene, you, you, you just wanted to invest in it because it just sounded just amazing, right? Um, but what ended up happening was that all these materials really moved forward, generally speaking, but the promise wasn't realized for investors. And I think a really good example of that is Nanosys, okay? This was the shining star for a lot of reasons. It was founded in 2001. They've taken 186 million. It's a decent uh, uh, size amount of funding. They've been through about a half a dozen pivots. So a uh, company pivots when, when you're a startup and you're trying to find your way in the world and what you just, well, your great idea didn't work out. You gotta do something. You can't shut the door, right? So you pivot and you, you find the next best thing. Well, the idea is that, you know, you pivot a few times and you hit the, the sweet spot and then you go, right? Uh, well, this company, their investors had a lot of patience so they, and they've pivoted, they've pivoted so many times that it, that just recently, I think this was, I think last August, they took a series I round from Shui Chemical, a Japanese, uh, Shui Chemical, a Japanese um, chemical firm. And I had to check because I'd never seen a series I, I thought it was series one. I thought it was a mistake in the database. And I looked at series I, the way that funding works is that and usually you'll have C, that's to get you going, right? And then the first real round from real VCs comes in the form of a series A, B, C, D. And as you go down that path, the later rounds are getting you closer to an exit, right? And your investors, they're, they want an exit, right? They don't want to sit in there forever. They want to return on their money. Well, 
I've actually never seen a series I. That's how far along Nanosys is in keeping taking funding, right? Their investors must not be very happy because they've been at it 20 years now and, and they still haven't had an exit. But in the meantime, right, they now call themselves the quantum dot company. So that's where they've settled on. There's 120 unique display products in production, like mass production using quantum dots. So there's nothing wrong with the technology. It did what it said it was going to do, right? So it's, it's found in displays all over the world. But in terms of investors who invested in Nanosys, hoping to, to hit the next Microsoft, that didn't quite work out. And, and, and again, you know, we don't have any, any insights into the, the financials or what's actually happening um, behind the, uh, the, the doors, right? But what we can also look at are examples in, in publicly traded stocks, okay? So this is a company called Minoco, and you can see at the bottom there, we did an article back in 2013 called Investing in Quantum Dots with Minoco, right? And I actually had, I, I found the story so compelling myself. I had bought some, some shares in the company and I didn't stick around for very long with companies like this. As soon as they start breaking promises, you, you, you run, right? As, as fast as you can. What, what you can see in the chart here is, is quite interesting. If you bought shares on the day that we wrote this article and you held them today, let's say you spent $1,000 in shares of Nanoco. Today, you'd have $100. You lost 90% of your money. That's not the worst part. The worst part is if you, instead of trying to cherry pick the next Microsoft, if you actually took that money and put it in a NASDAQ tracker ETF. So the NASDAQ, as you know, is a collection of technology stocks, right? Thousands. And the NASDAQ um, is, is, is quite diversified compared to a single stock. So you're taking a lot, lot less risk. You would have taken a lot less risk. And instead of $100, you'd have $2,680, right? So it wasn't just the money you lost, it was the opportunity cost. You could have taken so much less risk and you would have had a, so much more money, right? So um, that was an example of what we call a pick and shovel play, right? It seemed to make sense. Gee, quantum dots are cool, I'm gonna invest. Who makes quantum dots? Oh, gee, Nonoko, all right, I'm gonna buy shares of Noko, right? It, it all makes sense, but the reality is a different story. And on the next slide, we're gonna give you a, a number of more examples, okay? So these are uh, graphene producers that are publicly traded. We followed all of them over the years, right? Uh, fortunately, didn't invest in any of them because the, the share prices have, have been dreadful. There may be exception with Brasari and has been kicking lately, but, um, but, but, but forget about share price and look at, look at this, these pictures here. The blue is um, our losses and we don't care about losses, right? When you, when you disruptive tech, the idea is that you know you 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 put you put a bunch of money in and and you hope to get revenue growth. So losses are okay, but you absolutely have to show double digit revenue growth. That's there's no there's no exceptions to that. Why? Because if if a, if a disruptive technology is truly capturing market share in the in in double digits, then the revenues ought to follow the same trajectory, right? So the closest one I hear might be. Direct to plus, you can see they've got the right trend going there, right? But then you start to add up the numbers and you see, wow, look at the last year for all four of these. And this is in British pounds, but you can multiply it by 1.4 to get USD and you're still not anywhere meaningful, right? I mean, it's it's less than 15, you know, I'd say it's less than 20 million for these four companies that, you know, over the years have been talking about how many tons of carbon nanotubes they can produce. They built all this infrastructure, they built these big manufacturing facilities, and then nobody came around to buy this stuff. There was one company we talked to that is not one of these. And they said, wow, we sent out 260 samples. And like, we start digging in and they literally just picked 260 people and sent them 260 samples. And it's, and it's no surprise that they didn't get any sales from that, right? Because it, 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 they, they, they built the infrastructure before there was a need for it. And, you can still see today, and you read their investor decks, you read their annual reports, it's all about, it's just around the corner, right? They're doing graphene asphalt and they're doing this and they're doing that. And they just haven't got the, 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 the um, commercial application for, for uh, graphene in the tons. However, there are, graphene in fact is being commercialized. It, they just don't need people producing tons of it. So we did a piece in December, late last year, you could see here, 10 startups commercializing graphene products, okay? And this was quite interesting. Um, we just did a little research to come across this list and we picked 10 companies that have, you know, got some, some decent funding, got some traction or moving along. 
we'll go through here and, and, and touch on some of these. So Aura, um, they're building graphene enabled headphones for $500. Again, you know, how many of those are you gonna sell, right? So what's the total addressable market? That's what venture capitalists look, like, look at, right? There's how big of an opportunity do you have? Well, it's not very big, but potentially they can expand into other audio applications, right? So there's, there's some potential there. We've got Paragraph doing Hall effect sensors. Now, I spent uh, several hours trying to understand what those were, and I, I still couldn't articulate it to you. So that means I truly don't understand it, right? Um, then you have, but, but it's, it's interesting stuff, right? They're using it in, in space and whatnot. I don't imagine that the total addressable market is that big. Then you have Flextra Power. They're capturing biometrics from clothes. And as a lot of companies do these days, they're doing the pandemic pivot, right? So they're putting out graphene face masks. Well, that makes sense, right? Because graphene has a lot of uh, filtration applications. Uh, another company on here, LIGC, they're doing graphene air filters and, and graphene foam. A company on here called Integrated Graphene. They're doing also graphene foam, uh, along with biosensors and a and a graphene supercapacitor. So, <clears throat> there's a company I want to tell you about. It's not on this slide. It's an Estonian company called Skeleton Technologies. And I went I was over in Estonia in 29 late 2019, meeting with this company, and blown away by this the success story. And their success story was because they took graphene and they built a better supercapacitor. Okay, what's a supercapacitor? Well, so supercapacitor takes in a lot of energy really quick and releases it really quick. And what does a battery do? A battery takes in energy really slow and releases it really slow, right? So supercapacitors have, have certain applications. Um, They're used in, in all kinds of applications. And Elon Musk of Tesla, he actually purchased one of, one of Skeleton's big competitors, Maxwell. And he wrote a tweet about it and, and, and his, some magic he's creating with it, right? And he was supposed to do his PhD at Stanford on, on supercapacitors. But the, the point is that Skeleton took graphene, they used it to create a superior supercapacitor and they're selling them like hotcakes. Okay, there it is. That's how you do it, right? And their investors have gotta be just stoked. So Skeleton, I think <clears throat> probably the most uh, successful graphene uh, uh, um, startup that, that, that I had come across. Um, just to finish off the rest of these, so you've got a company called Nanotech Energy. They're doing graphene super batteries. See, we see a lot of battery tech startups using graphene, right, to try to make a better lithium ion battery. A lot of that stuff's under the radar, right, because these companies don't necessarily want everybody to know the, the advancements they're making, and they may not even release them, right? They, 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 they do that as part of product development in, in incremental improvements to batteries. So we don't get to see a lot of that, of what's going on there. Then you've got Tetrals water filtration membranes, right? So we talked filtration and water filtration as well for graphene is a, is a common use case. Cardia, this is pretty cool. So Cardia is building biological transistors using graphene. What they're doing is they're bridging um, biology and, and electronics. So before he died, St. Steve Jobs said that the next big thing was gonna be the intersection of, of biology and technology, right? And, and, and that's what we're seeing there. Um, and then, and then another company here doing something similar in brain is also using graphene implants for, um, brain computer interfaces. So that's also what Elon Musk has been dabbling in, right? So <clears throat> really interesting use cases. there, are really, uh, exciting stuff. So, so even though they, they, they didn't succeed in building the big, uh, factories to manufacturing graphene by the ton, we're still seeing progress being made by, by startups. And the other place that we need to, to. Uh, uh, watch, and, and this was mentioned in the earlier presentation um, on BNN, the BNN Nano presentation is, is the role of big companies, right? So you may have all heard of um, Sigma Aldrich. They were purchased by Merck and renamed to Millipore Sigma. And I just went to their webpage. I didn't even know they were dabbling in all these areas. And I went to their webpage and snipped this. Boy, they're representing everything there, right? Right? They've got the inorganic nanomaterials, they've got the carbons, the quantum dots, dendromers, it's all there, the nanoclays. They were actually using nanoclays, I think, in, in plastic bottles for so that you didn't have the taste of plastic on your beverage, right? Things like that. So um, th they're actually, they're taking all these nanomaterials, they're finding use cases for them and they're, and they're selling them to companies that, that you, you may not even know that, that they're actually using these things, right? So um, eventually, uh, everything bubbles to the top, right? So, so, so most of the, the, the success stories and, 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 and the, the, the real technology advancements, you, you may not even see because companies like Millipore 
and uh, 3M um, are, are, are just moving forward with them, right? And that goes to the earlier point in the earlier presentation about you know partnering with these companies because they can do a lot for you and it's not necessarily on their web page, as the gentleman said earlier. So um, the other place, I don't know why I'm doodling on my screen, but uh, we'll live with that. The other place uh, that has been a real success story, nano drug delivery. Okay, so um, that, that, that I was looking prior prior to this presentation. There's close to a hundred drugs that are have been approved by the FDA that are that are being sold commercially that use nanoparticles of, of some form, some form of, of nano drug delivery system. And you can see the the, the different types that are that are presented here on the screen. So the um, uh, all the vaccines, right? So so I think a, at least a couple of the, the vaccine providers are using lipid nanoparticles in, in the vaccines that they're using for the, the coronavirus, right? So uh, for MR, M, mRNA-based uh, therapeutics. So there, there have been a lot of success stories in, in nano drug delivery. As investors, we thought that was going to be some sort of Intel inside story, right? We were going to find that Flamel and Star Pharma had cornered the market. They had all the intellectual property. They were going to license that out to all the drug companies. And we we're going to sit there and, and collect the royalties. Well, that's not how it worked. Um, nano drug delivery, you know, these, these pharmaceutical companies have, de have developed nanoparticles. If it happens to, to, to be the optimal method of delivery, they use it. If it doesn't, great, right? And, and, it, and it just becomes... It, it's 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 mature enough that it isn't even something special, so it just it just becomes part of drug development now. Is that we can do things with nano uh, nanoparticles delivering drugs that we couldn't do before, and continue to sell more drugs. So there isn't really what what we what we call in the investment world a, a pure play way to invest in nano drug delivery. Right? It's incidental. It just happens to be the case uh, when you invest in a pharmaceutical company that you also uh, get some exposure to. Um, nanoparticles, if that's what they happen to be using. So last slide here, I want to talk a little bit about um, the changing face of nano. And this was mentioned earlier when somebody had mentioned, um, um, uh, Chiara had mentioned uh, uh, advanced materials, right? So, so nano hasn't gone anywhere. We're just starting to call it different things, okay? And this goes to, if you remember Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns, right? These are the things we don't know, we don't know. So there may be some really cool materials out there right now that we have no idea were enabled by, you know, some nanomaterial that uh, demonstrates superior advantages because it's being manipulated at the sub 100 nanometer, right? So, um, but, but, but as investors, that doesn't really matter, okay? And this is, I, I think people don't, I say founders don't want to hear this, but the truth of the matter is that, um, We've got to see revenues, okay? So we don't, as investors, as retail investors, we have actually a rule. We don't invest pre-revenue, and 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 there's there's VCs that have the rules too. But we're talking about stocks, and actually, that's a fair rule for stocks, right? If you don't have revenues yet, that's what you see a lot in biopharma. Well, biopharma is volatile. Why? Because the uncertainty of revenues is so it, it's so volatile, and that's out of their control, right? So um, pre-revenues are, are are something that. That, that, that typically we would avoid. For nanotechnology companies today, you have to show you solved a problem and somebody's willing to pay it or pay for it. And usually that's in the form of a reference customer. And who, that would be great if they're also on your cap table as an investor. So, so that's what we look for. And say so a lot of investors look for, right? In terms of what remains interesting to retail investors, we get people all the time asking us, I want to invest in graphene. They're still, they're still loving it, right? And We've got a couple pieces on that. We'll we'll send them and say, well, it's not what you think, right? And 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 there's enough. If it's anything over the counter, just just don't even we don't even. It's not even worth discussing. But but even you know the the the, the legitimate companies, at least for publicly traded stocks for retail investors, there's strong interest, but there just hasn't been that follow through. Okay, where there has been follow through, a lot of it isn't very sexy, right? You've got things like you know chemicals and coatings and lubricants and B2B type products, right? That that are gonna make a mint. There's they're high margin, they're making just a lot of money, but that's not the sort of thing that's gonna make it on the cover of a magazine or it's gonna make it on any sort of you know uh, investment forum. So a, a lot of the money to be had um, isn't isn't aren't things that are that are gonna be talked about. And just for this last bullet point, this is really a um, a can of worms that that we don't want to open, but it's really exciting and it's worth mentioning. So 
you know, I don't know how many of you, I, I, you know, I used to re read there's room at the bottom and Drexler's, you know, is gray goo. And I, I just found that stuff absolutely amazing. And that's what, that's why I started Nanolize as I read about nanotechnology, I was blown away. It's like, I got to invest in this stuff. This is just amazing, right? Synthetic biology. The question is, is this the new nanotechnology? And it, if you read about what a nanobot was, right? And the promise and the nanobot swimming through the bloodstream, like that stuff's here now and it's symbio. And there's already been the failure, all the stocks that failed, the, the, the failed promises. And now it's really climbing up that slope of, what is it, the slope of enlightenment? It's really climbing up that slope now. And there's some real promise. And some of this stuff is mind-blowingly cool, OK? Is it nanotechnology? Well, that's a different topic. That's a whole other story. And, and I was having this chat with Kiara about it. And, and you know, there's regulatory uh, implications around how you define things, you know, advanced materials. It's all really interesting, but the thing I think um, to watch in terms of what we watch in nanotechnology investing, and if I had to say an area that's that's really worth looking at, it's synthetic biology. It's super exciting. It's going to really change a lot of things, gene editing, all that, right? It's a tool in, in this synthetic biology toolkit. So um, that's about all I have. I, I would say if, if you go to Nanolize and you just subscribe to our newsletter, um, we send out every week our articles, and some are free and some are premium, but um, it's all good stuff, and, and the premium ones, you even get some free ones, so it's all good stuff, and uh, we, 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 we love tech, we're passionate about it, and, and, it, and it shows in, in, in the quality of our content, so I really appreciate um, the invite today, uh, Sean and, and, and Chiara, for, for inviting me and letting me speak, and happy to take any questions during questions time, so um, thanks so much, and I'll, I, I don't know if I hand this back over, I think I click stop share, and then it's over to you. It is indeed, Joe, and thank you ever so much for an interesting presentation. And just to conclude the sort of public part of this webinar, uh, I'd like to sort of thank all three of our speakers uh, for presenting some really interesting sort of ideas uh, and, and really sort of stimulating ideas. Uh, and I'd just like to say goodbye to all of those who aren't NIA members. Uh, and for the NIA members, please stay on the line and we'll go into Q&A. But for those who aren't NIA members, thank you ever so much for attending and hope some of you consider joining the NIA soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.